My name is Rebecca. I am the Director of Programs at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Foundation. Um, and I work with Elizabeth Sackler to provide additional support for the Center for Feminist Art here at the Brooklyn Museum. And I'm absolutely thrilled today to uh, welcome Erica Hinton and Nina Quintero, um, their families, and uh, Sandy Zag, the producer of the film that we're all about to watch, uh, and Susan Lazarus. And um, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to see Apache 8 here in the Brooklyn Museum. Um, I know we've wanted to have it screened since last spring, or I maybe, mean, yeah. So it's a, it's a wonderful treat to have everyone here for a conversation and to see the film. The Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art opened in 2007, and it's an exhibition and educational facility dedicated to the past, present, and future of feminist art. As the permanent home of the iconic work, The Dinner Party by Judy Chicago, the center strives to raise awareness of feminism's cultural contributions, to educate new generations about the meaning of feminist art, to maintain a dynamic learning facility, and to present feminism in an approachable and relevant way. The Feminist Gallery, which currently is featuring the show uh, Eva Hess, uh, Spectre's 1960, is only one piece of the center's program. At its core, it's a space for open and free discussion, discourse, uh, and the exchange of ideas. Um, Elizabeth Sackler, unfortunately, can't be here today because of an immediate health issue, but I know that she considers it a pleasure and a privilege to have these remarkable and courageous women fly in from uh, the Southwest in order to tell their stories at the Sackler Center through today's film. Um, so I'm going to bring up Susan Lazarus, one of the producers of the film, um, to introduce the film and the speakers to follow. Thank you. <laughs> It was 2007 when this institution was formed, uh, but that's when Sandy started making this film. She'll tell you the story of how she came upon the, the unit of firefighters and was totally inspired by them to tell their story. Um, we have also here Aunt Dolly, who you'll, who you'll see in the film, and Butch Gregg, who's a firefighter who was also working side by side with his wife Erica Hinton. So afterwards, there'll be a Q&A, so if you have any questions, please stick around. And thanks for coming, and enjoy. Catch you. Encouraging reports tonight from the Western Wildfire Zone. Firefighters say they are gaining ground on the giant Sholo fire in Arizona, thanks in part to a remarkable team of firefighters. A phone call in the middle of the night is routine for 51-year-old Cheryl Bones. Since 1976, Bones has been crew boss for Apache No. 8, and that means travel, often for weeks at a time. 21 days without a break, 90 hours a week on the line. They have a reputation for killing the toughest of fire. By reservation standards, where jobs are scarce, the pay is good. We went out that we left our families behind. I had three kids that I left behind, five, two, and one years old when I started. That was pretty tough. Chipri, NBC News, Sholo, Arizona. You never knew what you were going to face. You were with a bunch of women that could handle anything. My people respect me because I'm putting my life on the line to protect what, what is ours, the beauty of the reservation. When they first started, uh, they were probably the only women's, all women's crew, firefighting crew that was out there. This all male firefighting camp would be becoming organized, the camp setting up. Then all of a sudden, there's these ladies that come into camp and everybody's wondering exactly what's going on here. All heads would turn. 
Um, Susan was a producer of the documentary A Future Image Before My Eyes, funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. As a post-production supervisor, she worked on films ranging from Mississippi Masala, Bob Roberts, The Boxer, to The Door on the Floor Prime and Inside Man. Associate, her associate producer credits include Phyllis and Harold and Before You Go. Susan Lazarus more recently supervised post-production on Jim Jarmusch's The Limits of Control and Sean Durkin's film Martha Marcy May Marlene. Uh, she is an active member of the New York Women in Film and Television, has served on the board uh, as vice president in charge of programming, and is on the steering committee of the Women's Film Preservation Fund. So. director and producer, um, who's also a film distributor. Her short film, Central Park, premiered at Sundance in 1994. She went on to direct a feature called The Girl, which was based on a short story by French writer Monique Wittig that was at the Toronto and Berlin Film Festivals in 2001. Uh, she did a documentary called Soul Masters in 2008, and currently is developing a documentary on Monday Quintic. Come on up, Sandy. And, uh, we, have, we have in the audience, uh, well, let's start with, with Erica Hinton. Uh, Erica started with uh, Helipack, and come on up, and uh, you, you've heard about her throughout the film. So please sit here. Um, I want to introduce Butch Gregg. Is he here? He took the two months ago. He'll be back later. But, uh, and some of the children who were here were also featured in the film. And Nita Quintero. He's been working for 27 years. How many? About 17. 17 years, I'm sorry. With the with Apache 8 and is now a crew boss and it was out on the Wallow Fire this year. Uh, you might have seen some of the hell attack on the news this summer when that big fire was going on and you saw them dropping the buckets of water. That's, that's what they were doing. So, Sandy will, will ask if anyone's got any questions. So thank you all for being here. Um, Erica and, uh, and Nita and their families came from the uh, White Mountain Apache Reservation here. So as you saw on the map, the, the uh, reservation is, uh, is uh, in Arizona. And so we're very happy to have them come to New York City. This is Nita's first time in New York City. And uh, Erica was here when the film screened uh, at the Native American Film Festival at the Smithsonian. So um, I'm happy to to tell you some more about the movie, but perhaps there are some questions that you'd like to ask first, and uh, I can, we can all participate with any questions you might have. Yes, hi. Uh, first, congratulations on making such a, a personal film out of the subject. Uh, I just want to know, as a filmmaker, did you have, did you need a fixer, or did you go in by yourself, I mean, in terms of getting in deep to the culture and, and inside its family? Yeah, thank you. As a matter of fact, uh, Michael uh, Hughes is a filmmaker, and uh, I've distributed uh, two of his films with my personal company. I'm very happy that you came. Um, I met uh, some women firefighters when I was in the Phoenix airport, and uh, I, I walked through a group of women, and they were all in those yellow jackets that you see in the film. And uh, the energy around them, there were about there were many, many women, and they were in their 30s and 40s and 50s and, and 20s. And I just walked by them and I said, who are you guys? And they said, we're firefighters from Fort Apache. And the words just kind of spilled out of my mouth, I want to make a movie about you. So I got the telephone number of a crew boss. And I, and, uh, I called during the fire season to find out if I could go up into to, 
see if I could make a movie. And um, so uh, they told me to talk to Cheryl Bones because Cheryl had been interviewed by the press, I think a, a number of times. And so um, I called Cheryl and she, I said I'd like to come up and see if I could do a little scouting. So she dropped the phone down, she spoke to a supervisor and she said, you can come up. I said, right, like right away? And she said, yeah, you can come up right away. So I grabbed two friends of mine from Tucson and they came up and we did a little trailer. Um, and this little trailer we cut and we were introduced to Cheryl's sister, who's Pearl Harvey, who you see in the movie. And Pearl was actually the person that opened up all the doors uh, in the reservation for us. She told me how to operate. Um, and I did make several mistakes. So the first mistake was that little trailer that I made I had a meeting with the chairman, Ronnie Lupi, and uh, who you see in the film. And so uh, it was the moment when the iPhone came out. And so I gave him my iPhone, and he was watching this little trailer that we made, and he was smiling and looking at it. And finally, when the movie was over, he said, uh, where did you make this? And I said, here. And he said, who gave you permission? And I thought, oh no, I never asked for permission to film on the reservation. So he said, this is a sovereign nation, and you, if you go to England, you have to follow the rules of England. If you're on the reservation, you have to follow the rules here. And so he said, 10 years house arrest. <laughs> I was like, and I kept spinning and talking, and then he said, okay, five years. And then he just left and he said, no, you, you have to, you have to do, do this correctly. So I had to go to the tribal council, and then after that, Pearl introduced me to the cultural council, and um, I was very, very supported, actually. Um, so th that was the, the beginning of the learning process. So someone have a question for? Sure. Thank you for coming. For Nita or Erica? Well, I wanted to ask about what happened this summer. I mean, and so. Where, Nita, where did you, where did you go um, to work on these summer wildfires that were so fierce? Um, my first fire was at the, um, it's not on the reservation, but it was like one of the, one of the history fire again. It's called a wildfire, which was about probably another four or five thousand plus acres that was burned. But it came close to the reservation, but we were on our side of the reservation, but the other side, it pretty much burned, so. I've been to almost like, probably five, six fires this past summer. And I wanted to mention that some of the footage is shot with a, with a little camera. It's a, called the helmet cam. And Nita was the first person that I gave the helmet cam to, Erica and Nita were the first people I gave the helmet cam to. So some of those shots, they're actually, when I couldn't be with them, they took a helmet cam on and they shot the fire scenes. So actually they're cinematographers in the film as well as being featured firefighters. And they did an, an amazing job, really. How are you um, dealing with the situation um, with the drugs? Because it seems like that's causing a lot of family tension. Is there things within your culture that you're doing about it? Is there institutions that are set up for some of the young people to get help? How are you dealing with that in the communities? America, you want to talk? I'm not really sure. I think there is um, like help out there. But I'm, <laughs> I'm not really sure because, like, in the summertime, I'm just, like, always working. You know, it's like I don't even have a life. I just work all the time. And then um, when I do get laid off, I just spend time with my family. And I know there is a lot of things going on on the reservation, but I know there is help. But it's, like, really up to the kids, you know, if they want that help. And so I know it is bad, but I don't really like try to deal with that stuff. I just kind of hear about it. <laughs> so that's, that's all I can say. 
it may not be as widespread as people think. Yeah, but you know, it is there and it, it's really bad. And you know, there's a lot of young kids. It seems like um, there's like a lot of alcohol too because you know, you go to the store and there's like all these young kids that are just wasted and you know, trying to ask for money and it is really sad. Opportunities or lack thereof. Yeah, but like I said, I'm just like always working, and if I'm not working, I'm with my family because the time I lose for them in the summer, then I try to you know, spend as much time as I can when I'm not working. Okay, thank you. Jess? Um, I, I guess this is a silly question, but I'm just wondering how long a fire typically burns. And, you said you worked on six, um, you know, you said you worked on six fires uh, this past summer. So I was just wondering, like, how long they usually burn for and how big they get, or is it usually one big one? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> once we get uh, called up for an assignment to the, one of these fires, and then it's like, it takes you, usually takes like about two weeks to stay at that fire, to control that fire. And if it's a real huge fire, you can like stay two weeks or you can stay another week, which is like 21 days. But especially like a huge fire like this, it would take like forever to get it out. Yeah, mm -hmm. it could take like a month, maybe like even two months. Depends like the weather, you know, if it's really dry and then what's out there to burn. If there's a lot of timber, then you could just take that out. And then once the grass comes, that's when, um, Usually you can get, kind of get a hang of the um, fire, but it depends what's ahead of you. So it could be like weeks, it could be two weeks, it could be, I mean, it just, you, you can't say. But you can't, you have a shift that has, to, because of the smoke inhalation, do they, they, do they limit the shift that um, you can be out in the fire? It depends on the fire behavior. If it's like really rapid, then, you know, there's really nothing you can do. I mean, you can put water on there, but it's just like spitting on it. So then we saw like how the helicopters dropped the water, but mm -hmm. for those of you on foot, how do you fight the fire physically? Do you fight it? Oh, we have crews on the fire there. And then like for Erica, I said she's on the helicopter crew. She has like about maybe two or three people out there working with her. So you have like um, your handheld radio. And then there's some kind of flagging that they use out there. And so for her, her part, for where, her, where she works, it's usually like a small fire. It's usually like a two to five acre fires. So that one she can, in her squad, they can just take it out within like a day or so. But so. do you guys physically throw water on it or? Like, like you've seen in the show that we used, the tools that we use out there that they gave us. So then for her part, she can use the water, she called the helicopter. So there's two ways. Yeah, and then there. like, um, once you get out there, um, you just build line like all day and it's like hard. And this then, way build line is so you can know. Um, like, you know, like the tools you've seen, you could build line like a trail size or it could be like the size of the room you build. And it's, like a, it's like a big. Yeah, it just basically, you just clear everything out. And you know, in front of you, you have the tools, you have the saws, and it depends on the line. Like, it could be this small, it could be this, and then like the size of the room. And when I went with um, the hot shots, <laughs> that was hard. That was really hard um, because of like the water I have to carry, and then the food, and you have to be like self-sufficient for 24 hours. And it's just hot and you know, it's dusty and um, cause when we got out there, we worked on the station fire. I don't know if you guys heard about that in California. Well, it was like one of the biggest fires and they were already out there and we caught up with them like a week later. And that whole time they didn't really do anything. They just kind of stood by because of the fire behavior. So once we got there, the first day we were out in line and we built line, I think it was like a dozer size. and. 
it was hard because you just work, you work all day. And I remember thinking the first day I got there, I was like, what am I doing here? I should have just stayed home because, you know, we're trying to um, get shade and you just have to build your own shade. You're sitting there, you're, you're just dirty, you're sweaty, and you're just working hard. And then um, the hiking too, it's, it's, it's really hard because it's like up and down and it's real steep. And with the hot shots, you know, it's just a bunch of guys and me and a, another girl. And um, they don't stop. You know, once you start, you just keep going until you get to the area where you need to be. And I'm proud to say that, you know, I kept up with them. And there was a couple of guys that um, stopped. But, you know, we just kept going. We kept going. And we get on the line, like, at 8 o'clock. And we work till nighttime. And then we have to hike out. And it's, like, three, four hours. No, three miles, actually. Three, seven miles to get back to the crew cab. And, um, you know, there's days where you don't shower, you know, like six, six, five, seven days, you know, you're out there, you get dropped off at the helicopter and there's like no service, no nothing, you know, you have what you have to eat. There's days where we just go with MREs, you know, just that's, that's the only thing we have. And, but it was really steep when I went with them. The areas we worked at, you know, it was just like steep. So when you would sit down, you would kind of have to dig like a trench just, you know, in order to sit. And we're like hiking up, we're hiking down. And it was really hard, but I'm glad to say that I did it. And it is, a hard, you know, it's a hard job. You know, I like doing it. So building line. Is it like a big trench? Like yeah. A big, a, a line is like a big hole, but it, it, it's, a, it's all a long way, so that the fire can't jump over it. Yeah. So there's nothing on it. It basically looks like a trail, you know, yeah. like a walking trail. But sometimes, like I said, it, it depends. Like it could be really big. You could be like a mile, two miles away from the fire, and so you know you have to clear that out. Or sometimes they use a dozer. So like once the fire gets there, you know, it's out. But you also have like the helicopters dropping. So you know, it's always about safety too. Because you have a lot of people with you. Right. When, uh, when we have these shots in the film of the helicopter, your helicopter shots, and you saw that big, it's called a bambino, is that right? Mm -hmm. It's a bambino, it's like a big basket that drops into the water. We actually put one of those little handy cams on a helicopter when we were in OMAC. And so the, you got this shot from the helicopter of the bucket dropping into the water and coming up and moving over the land. It's one of my favorite shots that we got because it would be impossible to actually get that shot any other way. So um, Going, we also went, when we went out to OMAC, that was the first time that we actually followed the firefighters. There was a fire call, and as a matter of fact, there were several fires, and they didn't know where they were going. They knew that they were going west, <laughs> so uh, I said, please give me a call. Let me know where you, when you find out if you're going to California or, or yeah. Washington. So we just waited until they called, and then we actually flew um, while they were driving. Nita and Erica were driving there, and so we met them in OMAC, where there was a fire, and it was actually, um, you know, not so easy to get permission to go out on a fire. Um, but most of the people who were actually in charge of um, the the guests, say the press or other people coming out of the fire, were women. And so when we told them about the film, they were particularly helpful in letting us get out there to to follow to follow them. We had news crews that were very interested in following uh, the Apache 8 uh, crew members in the Wallow fire, which just happened recently, but they couldn't get out to find them. They were so deep into the fire that the crews that were interested in following them, NBC, uh, couldn't, actually, couldn't actually reach them. Because they were really, really far out into the fire zone. Um, so, um, any other questions? I wanted to introduce Aunt Dolly. Aunt Would Dolly's you stand here, up yeah. and say hello to everybody? <laughs>
like to know how you convinced Anita to come to Washington. How did you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You I here, come sit here. First time with Anita. We have a mic. Here, come sit here. here. On. Here, come sit in the chair with the microphone. <laughs> I was saying that was the first trip I went with Nita to uh, Washington D.C. about uh, coming out there. So when she's talking about, I didn't know I was gonna go. I was still working. I've been a like an LPN nurse. I've been working for about 40 years in the hospital. And I retired from there now, so I can do what I want. But then uh, there was a great trip that I had. There's the uh, Bill Hess, that's my son-in-law, married to my niece. And he did a great job for us for traveling. We went to all the things that you see in DC. This is the second time I am in it, so I was telling my niece, Nita, where is the third one you're going to take me? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm so happy to be with her anytime, because I lost my sister, her mom as a young mom, and uh, I'm always thinking about her, and when she's away on the fire, I kind of get scared, but then I just pray about it, and I told Nita, I just pray as long as you working on that fire now, don't forget about the Lord, think about him, he'll help you. So I'm so happy to be with her on my second trip, so I was asked her, where is our third trip now? Where are we going to go? <laughs> so I'm happy. When, uh, when, Thank you. when I started making the film, um, I, I didn't have any idea of who the people in the film were going to be. I just knew that there was this all-women crew. And so at the time, I thought it would be a movie about Apache 8 crew. But when I met Nita, and Erica and Katie and Cheryl and became familiar with their personal stories. I, we interviewed about 30 people, maybe more, 30 firefighters, and their stories were the ones that came, came to the surface. And uh, the fact that Me Too Sunrise Ceremony was in National Geographic was a total surprise. And uh, the fact that Erica, within the timing of the film, became the first woman Apache hotshot was also um, just a, a, an incredible um, success story. And that Nita became a, the crew boss um, after training for, uh, for years to become a crew boss. And the fact that you know, Cheryl has a statue to her, herself in, in, uh, in her image in Boise, Idaho. So none of these things did I know. It's not as though I said, oh, I heard a great story about a, a great woman that I want to feature. So um, I feel that the film was actually very, was blessed. We did a, a, a ceremony with a, the medicine woman before the beginning of, this, of the film, and uh, the doors were really open because it is not so evident to be an outsider and to come to a, a to a place and to be welcomed and to be um, to for people to open their heart, which 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 they have done, and giving their total support to the film, and so um, I just want to say. Uh, Again, how grateful I am to you both and to Aunt Ali for being in the film, um, and, and to Nita for uh, uh, from all of your fam all of their families uh, and their stories and all of the reservation that was uh, very supportive. There was a moment when uh, the chairman had never seen the film, so we delivered the film by hand to the chairman, um, and uh, so he took the film and he he just you know, went in the house and then uh, a couple of days later called uh, the person who had delivered the film and said, I really like it. And uh, I really can't hardly tell you what a relief it was to me <laughs> that the chairman supported the film.
keep a balance between, let's say, your own traditional ways and learning about like, and Christianity and, and how does that work within the culture? Does that you pass it down to your kids like that? Does it ever become complicated? <laughs> yeah, while well, we're back home on the reservation, there's like a Christian way and a traditional way. So usually a lot of kids, they're more into the traditional way now. So when they go to church, uh, they, they know the Lord and, the, and pray to the God and stuff. But once they get into the traditional way, they really want to learn more in the traditional way because there's a lot of singing, they do a lot of sacred stuff when they do the sunrise dances. So <clears throat> mostly like the kids now, they're more to tradition. So. So they usually put the, the church uh, stuff on the side. <laughs> um, I know there is some people out there that, that some of the churches, you know, the they call them holy rollers, <laughs> um, they say that's bad, you know, like our tradition, but I know that it's not because we pray to one God and we know that there's only one, but there's some people, they say, well, no, you know, you can't do that. But, you know, that's our tradition. And I'm sure they were raised in that way because my mom, you know, she's really traditional. Um, when I was young, I had a favorite dance too, like um, Nita. And, you know, I want that for my daughter. And, you know, we should be proud of where we came from. And um, I know when people talk against it, I think, like, you know, there, like I said, you know, there is only one God, and I don't know why they want to try to push that away. And you know, that's that's who we are. You know, that's that's our tradition, and we shouldn't let that go. And I mean, you know, I'm proud to say that. I'm right now, Apache. Mm -hmm. Is there any comments on that? <laughs> traditional dancing is coming from a long way, way back. Even myself, my mom taught me what to do. She had planned to make a dance for me and I didn't know what was going on. That's just uh, when a, a girl has the first spirit, that's the time it would start. You know, and then the way they believe is uh, <coughs> In the old days, the way they believe, if you have a uh, that, it's supposed to make you a strong woman and live a long life. That's, that's the real main thing. Do what you have to do for a family as a mom. If you have a family, start having children, you got to stand for them and work. And once a man has to go to work, that's the way it was, way back. But things have changed in the years that I noticed myself. A lot of things have changed. It used to a very um, traditional dance would be it's a sacred thing for us, for us Apache people. And I believe that myself because I had mine and I, I what my mom, mom told me, I think she was doing the right thing and taught me the, the right thing because that's what I did for myself. And I'm still living here and I'm very proud of it. I do have a family. I have girls, but I never had a dance for them because my girls, they are not full-blooded Apache. They have Hopi. Their dad was a Hopi. But I lost him, so I'm kind of alone. Bringing up my own children, but they're all on their own now. My children are all on their own. And they kind of left me at the house by myself, but I do okay. So I'm very proud of what my mom taught me about this traditional dance. I think I'm a, a strong woman myself, I would say.
Yeah, it's a question. Was your question back? Was it? <laughs> Not a question. Oh. Nita, anything else you'd like to say? Um, yeah, I'm very honored to be here, and um, I really like this film myself too. Even though there was like people were talking back home about it, but you know, I'm glad to be here. Glad you're an honor for to, for Sandy and Susan. And I was so surprised when I saw Susan out there. And it was like when I first met her and I asked her where she was from. She goes New York, and I said, Wow, what are you doing out here in Arizona? You better watch out for these wild Apaches out here. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, well, since you're with me, nothing's going to happen with you, so I'll take care of you. She goes, okay. <laughs> so that's how I met Susan. She's a good friend of mine also. And I'm glad to be out here and honor myself. Apache 8 crew for 14 days before it went co ed, and I was like, 14 days, is that enough? Yes. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> so, if there are no other questions, um, just uh, thank you so much for coming. Really wonderful to, uh, to be here, and uh, I thank Elizabeth Sackler and, uh, for her support of the film, and we're um, we're just very, very honored to be a part of it and to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, I've got one thing for Jess, though. I really want to thank you, Jess, for, Thanks, Jess. for this place here. Thanks, Jess. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you all so much for coming um, and flying out here. It really meant a lot. Um, and um, it was wonderful. It was wonderful to hear your stories, see the film. And, um, if people are interested, is there a way for them to, to get the film? Yeah, the film is being distributed by Native American Public Telecommunications, um, and it's also being distributed uh, by Women Make Movies.